Hello City Life family, nice to be with you. Sorry I can't be with you in person today. Um, I was taken in for an eye operation uh, that was brought forward from the expected date to Saturday the 31st and it just meant that um, I didn't know if I'd be okay to speak to you live today so I recorded this a couple of days earlier. So sorry about that but hopefully the message will still carry. God's in it with us. And I pray before I start that God will give you everything you need as I speak about this subject to um, really be convicted and really be encouraged by God in what he's saying to us at this time. Hopefully this message will resonate with you as it's resonated with me. This is called this evening, we're calling this whole month actually, um, making space for God and moving from rest. It's the attempt to look at eliminating the hurry from our lives and as you know many of us have read the book the elimination of the ruthless Elim elimination of hurry by john mark homer and found it so helpful and if you haven't read it i thoroughly recommend it but we thought we must at least give some time to looking at this subject so our connect group resources are on the same themes and the talk that i'm doing this evening and the talk at the end of the month by paul will all be looking at this theme so hopefully we'll really speak to you the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, looks at a disease that most of us are suffering from much more prevalent than COVID-19 even, which is something in these days, isn't it? Hurry sickness being that disease, characterised by continual rushing and anxiety, um, and those with the disease always feel short of time, therefore they're trying to perform every task much quicker, uh, they become flustered if there's an interruption to that task or if they have any kind of delay. And life becomes a continuous struggle to accomplish more and more tasks or participate in more and more things and events um, with less and less time available. And the, the well-known medic, I'm calling her here, of course she's not really a medic, she's a spiritual advisor, Ruth Haley Barton, identifies the most common um, symptoms of this disease as one, irritability, I don't know what she means, two, restlessness, Three, compulsive overworking. Four, emotional numbness, feeling flat with no real capacity for empathy. Escapism, distracting behaviours, number five. Six, disconnection to identity and calling, being only reactive and not really able to be proactive about much. Seven, not attending to basic needs. And it's interesting to note that before the invention of the light bulb, People got 11 hours sleep um, and now they celebrate if they get seven. And there'll be some of us saying here now, what, seven? That's a luxury. And eight, the attitude of hoarding energy, unable to cope with another demand. So we store up any spare time and don't offer it because we feel we just haven't got enough. And nine, slippage of spiritual practices. God taking lower priority, maybe not in heart, but certainly in the way it outworks in our lives. And 10, isolation, disconnection from God, others, and even ourselves. And the biggest thing about hurry sickness that we should note is that it's incompatible with love because love takes time and hurrying doesn't allow for it enough. So I don't know if any of you are feeling uncomfortable. I know when I heard that list, I listened to on a podcast, first of all, that Polly had recommended um, from Bridge Church, which is where the message came from. Um, I remember thinking, oh my goodness, so many of those 10 features are part of my life. And uh, so I don't know if you're also convicted, if you're feeling unwell with hurry sickness, but it's good to talk about it if we are and to try and make attempts to pull back because this isn't godly. This isn't his heart for us. It's not his will for us to be living like this. And I've certainly felt that um, as we've gone into lockdown as we've gone into having a bit more time to reflect, not seeing so many people, maybe not doing so many things if we've had furlough periods or times where it's been different. Others, of course, have been manically busy and going the other way. But for those of us who've had a bit of space and time, it's certainly been highlighted to us by God himself, really, that he wants that time with us. And many people on the survey we put out said that this time had offered them um, a way of getting back into some of those rhythms that allowed him to have more space and time, more time to pray, talk to God, listen to God. So it's definitely something that God is on God's agenda at this time and needs to be on ours. 
Hurry and over business is responsible for many other issues too, such as anxiety, anger, loneliness, burnout and exhaustion. And in fact, hurry sickness is identified as the main trigger of chronic stress, anger issues and heart problems. Many psychologists agree that people are too busy to live emotionally healthy lives and certainly spirit, they're not able to live, live spiritually rich lives. Eugene Peterson agrees that busyness is an illness of the spirit. So I did definitely feel very convicted by these views, by my own heart as I began to look at this. Because we're overly busy and stressed, we look to distractions therefore to give some relief from the treadmill and that's not necessarily helpful to us either. A man called Ronald Rollheiser says, today it is difficult not just to think about God or to pray, but simply to have any interior depth whatsoever. We, for every kind of reason, good and bad, are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. It's not that, just we've, it's not that we have anything against God or depth or spirit. We would like these, it's just that we are habitually too preoccupied to have any of these show up on our radar screens. We are more busy than bad, more distracted than non-spiritual, and more interested in the movie theatre, the sports stadium, the shopping mall, and the fantasy life they produce in us than we are in the church. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within our spiritual lives. Distractions may give us some entertainment, maybe some momentary relief within the daily stresses of our lives, but they don't bring us to rest. And God is the God who speaks of us finding rest. Mankind's first day was a day of rest, enjoying everything that God had worked to provide for us, exploring creation with him. And the work of caring and nurturing that earth didn't begin until after a sacred day of resting and exploring and being refreshed with God. That's supposed to be the rhythm of our lives. Working from rest with God was reinforced when he instituted a day at the start of the week from work with time given to enjoyment of him and each other and he called it Sabbath. God doesn't need Sabbath rest. We are the ones that need Sabbath rest and so God created it for us because he knows that we need it. We need to work from that place. Jesus said in Mark 2, 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, which also translates, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. Sabbath was God's gift and blessing to mankind. It meets our need for rest and refreshment rather than it being a demanding bunch of limitations, which unfortunately the religious of that day made it into. Jesus also said in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I wonder how many of us are living under that yoke or whether we're under the yoke of our society and hurry sickness and all that that brings with it. Most of us are not living this way and that's why God said at the start of lockdown and even before he was talking to some of us about it, about wanting to reset things, about wanting to make over things so that we could have this space with him. And as I say, this is what our survey that we did with you all seemed to um, reinforce. And being able to rest is a sign of being a free people, not slaves. Slaves have no rest and have to work unceasingly. I was really shocked and appalled recently. My daughter works, she leads um, A21 Europe, uh, which is the anti-trafficking charity. And she had received some updates from the airports and some updates generally on the scene of trafficking. She, she said in that, she showed a picture of these large incontinent, incontinence pants that workers, potential workers, slaves, were being told they would need to wear because there would be no comfort breaks in their day, no time at all. 
to cease from work, um, take a comfort break, and they were therefore being required to wear these, these big pants. I was really shocked. This treatment of others is happening today. It's abhorrent to us. It's certainly abhorrent to God. People being enslaved to anything is abhorrent to God because he wants us to be free and he died that we could be free. He hates sin, so he made a way for us to be forgiven and be rendered unpunishable, which is amazing because Jesus has covered our sins, past, present and future. And by his blood, we can be set free to be a perfect people, completely forgiven of our sins. He abhors poverty, so he gave us a kingdom economy, which those of us who have employed that kingdom economy of tithes and offerings have seen be really fruitful. It cuts us free from a lot of the debt and problem that the rest of the world is in. He gave us this economy so that we would live as free and being able to be generous to others rather than constantly fighting financial battles. He releases heaven's riches upon earth when we obey and accord with his kingdom economy guidelines. He hates us being enslaved to work and busyness, so he gave us rest. All these things that he provided so that we could be a free people have to be received by us and they have to be employed by us. We can't just know about them, we have to apply them to our lives. And definitely this issue of rest is one that he's highlighting that we need to make use of. Sabbath is not necessarily just an Old Testament thing. It's something that we need to take the spirit of and apply to our lives today. If we will give God our time and rest, as much as we would give him our tithes and offerings, we will see that all of life gets impacted and it gets infused by him supernaturally through our obedience, which is what we find when we give our money. Regarding money, Malachi in 3.10 tells us to prove God in our giving of tithes and offerings and we will see him open the floodgates of heaven and pour out abundant blessing on us. If we really trusted God to do this, of course we'd give him everything, but it's a journey and a tithe is a start. And it's a significant step of faith from which to prove God faithful. And many, as I say, can testify, including me, of his faithfulness in this respect. We couldn't afford not to tithe in our household. We couldn't afford not to give our offerings. God has so blessed us as we've done that. Of course, we can think we can't afford it. Of course, we think we're already too stretched. But if we will prove God in it, he proves faithful. And I think we've got to do the same with our time and our rest. We've got to prove God in it. We've got to give it up, even though we feel stretched, even though we think we haven't got any available time. We've got to make space for God and let him do something supernatural through our obedience. Wayne Muller in his book on Sabbath says, because we do not rest, we lose our way. We miss the compass points that would show us where to go. We bypass the nourishment that would give us succour. We miss the quiet that would give us wisdom. We miss the joy and love born of effortless delight. I think our time and rest is a valuable commodity just as our finances are valuable. And we have to take baby steps and prove God. I read another good book over lockdown by Shauna Nequest, and it's interesting that um, Hannah mentioned it on Sunday in her Shine talk. She mentioned reading this book, which is Present Over Perfect. And she says, we need to find a new way of living that allows for rest, as much as is needed, not just enough to get us through without tears, enough for us to feel alive and whole, grounded and gracious. Part of being an adult is taking responsibility for resting our bodies and souls, learning to meet our own needs. Our internal voices can tell us to achieve and accomplish, but that will never end up making us feel how we want to feel. We think if we push enough, we will feel proud, happy, whole, but what we feel is exhausted and resentful. Activity may seem to keep us from feeling the cavernous ache which asks, am I loved? Does someone see me? Do I matter? Am I safe? But drivenness and overwork like this is a kind of drug we use to anaesthetise ourselves with, along with shopping, sex, binging on TV, cleaning, etc. Like any drug, they silence the pain for a while, 
but they also make us less able to connect with things that matter, like our own hearts or other people. Drugs of any type isolate people. And of course they enslave and rob us, rob us of being a free people. And that's what God is wanting for us to continue to be, free people. That's how Jesus made us to be. I want us to take a bit of time and break out now. Maybe we've got 10, 15 minutes. Um, just to take a moment, first of all, just take the first minute and pause and just reflect on what you've heard. See what maybe God has highlighted to you through this time. And then briefly share with one another what has spoken to you most and why. And after those few minutes, we'll come back and I've got a bit more to share about what God has been saying to me personally at this time. Thank you. I hope you had some good discussions in the breakout room. I'm sure there's many more to have and much reflection to give so far, but I just want to continue now with um, the topic a bit further, a little bit about what God's been saying to me personally. But first of all, just to reiterate that um, resting with God has a multifaceted impact. It gives us a pause from the demands of the day. It gives us space to connect with ourself, with God and with others. And it also gives us time to reflect here and maybe even change perspective. All these things are relieving and soothing and they begin to displace the effects of living in a fast paced society um, and a demanding culture. So it may even help us if we start doing this to take some time and space with God to change our perspectives on how we live each day. It may actually infuse culture so that we can shape culture rather than being impacted by the negative aspects of our hurried culture of the moment. Personally, one of the most impacting books that I read recently was by a nun called Macrina Wydeka. I think that's how you pronounce her surname. Um, it was a book entitled A Tree Full of Angels. And she talks very much about finding God in the ordinary things of every day. But you need to take the, sp the space and time to do that. So I'm just going to quote her because it's a beautiful quotation. I can't say things any better than she can, that's for sure. And uh, just listen to what she says about this whole subject. A spiritual awakening is taking place in the world today. An authentic yearning to touch the depths of who we are and to rekindle the soul. It is understandable that we should be drawn to the mystical, for implanted within us is a seed of the divine. But the fast pace of our lives makes it difficult to find grace in the present moment. And when the simple gifts at our fingertips cease to nourish us, we tend to crave the sensational. Everything in life can be nourishing, everything can bless, but we have to be present for the blessing to occur. This is a decision we are invited to make each day. Due to the reality of our distracted, cluttered and noisy existence, the decision for real presence is not easy. We are too busy to be present, too blind to see the nourishment and salvation in the crumbs of life and the experiences of each moment pass us by. There is no person, experience, thought, joy or pain that cannot be harvested and used for nourishment on our journey with God. We must see the holy in the ordinary and harvest the crumbs. Living in the fast lane of life impairs our ability to see and harvest. If we want to see the depths, we will need to slow down. Holiness comes wrapped in the ordinary. There are burning bushes all around us. Every tree is full of angels. Hidden beauty is waiting in every crumb. And if we are willing to stay long enough to unwrap the ordinary, we will harvest its treasure. Will we be there with eyes open? Will we unwrap? the gift of the ordinary? Will we gather up the crumbs? Will we harvest angels hidden in those crumbs? Glory comes streaming from the table of daily life. Will we catch the rays or remain blind to the holy through being too busy to see? Are we able to be still enough to become intimate with the one who lives within? God too has a deep yearning for us. As I say, I can't put it any clearer than that. And I, I'm craving living like that. I'm done chasing accomplishment and achievement in order to feel okay. Which means I have to change my expectations of myself. I have to change what I think other people expect of me. 
and I have to trust myself to rest with God and see what he will do. When God is calling another to do something over there, I must be okay with resting with him here, if that's what he's telling me to do, which it is what he's telling me to do. And I need to do that without the feeling of not being responsible or that I'm losing my grip. My body, soul and spirit crave to see him in the ordinary every day. So I must slow down to let that happen without thinking I'm losing capacity. Joining our prayer mornings two to three times a week has been liberating, except for the awful alarm going off at 5.45 to make it happen. But from 6 to 6.15, we have a burst of prayer, which really does set up the day, and I have to commend it to you. And we follow the Lectio 365 pattern of pray, P-R-A-Y. Pause, rejoice and reflect, ask and yield. Those are the, the content, that's the content of that 15 minute slot. And so that first pause is just literally taking one minute to sit back, be still, and just turn our faces towards God and give our attention to him. And I can't tell you, as we settle back and breathe out and get still, you feel yourself uncoiling, you feel yourself, and you, as your mind and soul turns toward God, you just feel the relief of that. I know others who set up an alarm about lunchtime, 12 o'clock in a day, and they just say the Lord's Prayer and turn their face towards God then, just to interrupt the day and to recenter and to reconnect. And these are baby steps, but they're all in the right direction. So maybe you want to consider some of those. All we know is we can't continue as we are, as we were. God is looking for something new. He wants us to reset things internally so that we can reset things maybe externally. He wants us to reflect, slow down, go deeper, connect, and then maybe create. I was on a train the other day, heading for my Nana duties, which I do once a week, on a Tuesday up in London. And I reached a part in a book I was reading, the Prophetic Warrior book by Emma Stark, another great read. And it calls for an activation. So I'm sitting on the train and it said, take five minutes to ask God what he wants to say to you now and just write it down, free flowing, don't stop. And I'm on the train, I'm not in the best sort of frame for it, not in the best situation, I don't think, although the trains are quite empty at the moment. And uh, I just thought, I don't know, God, if I'm in the mood for this, but I felt, no, I'm gonna do it. And I was on my computer, so I just tapped it out, so not as fast as I might do if I was writing. But God spoke to me really clearly, and he said this, Bev, you don't have to fear that I've taken my hand off your life, that your life in me is waning like a dried up stream. My rain is coming afresh to you. It's coming to fill the riverbed and bring the level up. The stream will become a river and you will flow with me and be part of the next move of my spirit. Don't question or worry or try to understand. Don't compare with others what I'm doing in them. I have made you to be unique and to be who you are for such a time as this. You are part of the bigger picture, but you must be yourself and keep true to being you. I love you. Don't worry that you are emptying and think you're becoming redundant. There is more coming than you can ask or imagine, and you remain my beloved. Nothing will ever change that. Be at peace and see what I will do. What I will do. What I will do. And then I finished. And literally, I just wrote like that, just so fast, to didn't even really think about what I was writing. And then I see afterwards how much God has spoken to me. And as I've prayed into it, I've seen other certain things. The first thing I did was underline all the commands in it. I've been asking God to work on my heart, and this is part of the answer he's giving me. So I, I had to see what he was saying that I needed to absolutely do. What were his commands? And his commands were this, don't question or worry or try to understand. Don't compare with what I'm doing in other people. Be yourself and keep true to being you. Don't worry that you are emptying. Be at peace and see what I will do. These were all commands, they were all instructions. And it wasn't what I expected from God, but of course what God gives us is very rarely what we exactly expect, is it? But anyway, the other thing he said was that I am emptying. 
don't worry that I'm emptying, as if he has something to do with that. My emptying and refilling are his work, and he wants me to see what he will do, and he says it three times to me. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because to be refilled, which is what I've been praying for, and the new wine, to fill our glasses, etc., to fill our wineskins, wineskins, not glasses, I don't even drink. Anywho, he's wanting us to be refilled and some of us have got to be emptied before we can be refilled. I know I'm being emptied. God is doing something. It's not just that I feel empty, that I haven't got anything to bring maybe. It's that he is emptying me and I can trust that process and that makes me feel an awful lot better because I can trust that he is at work and it's not that I'm doing something that's stopping him being at work. And then Tony Classen popped in the other week, haven't seen the man for 20 years, bless him, showed up on my doorstep. Within a 15 minute conversation, we prayed for each other and he prayed for me and he says, I just see you like an empty wine glass and it's being filled up and God says there will be fulfillment, which is exactly how God has said it to me when I started to write a story about the other story that he gave me. He said, you will see fulfillment. So God is speaking and he's wanting me to just embrace the process of being emptied so that he can refill and do what only he can do. It's a work of God. And so my questioning and my worrying can only undo it. So that's why he's told me not to do that. And I think the same is true for City Life Church. I think we've got a journey to make and it's not the same as maybe he's making with other churches. We've got a unique journey just as I've got a unique journey, just as you've got a unique journey. The church has got a unique journey. And I don't think we do compare necessarily with what others are doing at this time or feel is right to do. But we have to be true to who we are a city life. We have to be a prophetic church, responding to his words, aligning with his words, and letting him do what he wants to do in and through us, just as he will with other churches. So we need to be at rest and be at peace with what he's doing. And I hope this encourages some of you who might be feeling this way or that way, that he is at work and we can be at peace and rest in what he is doing. And if you feel empty, don't worry. And so I'm going to end now with the prayer from Lectio 365. I'm going to pray their Sabbath blessing over us. And, uh, and that's where I'll finish today. So bless you all. May this day bring rest to our hearts and homes. May God's image in us be restored and our imagination in God be restoried. May the gravity of material things be lightened and the relativity of time slow down. May we know grace to embrace our own finite smallness in the arms of God's infinite greatness. May God's word feed us and his spirit lead us into the week and into the life to come. And we all said, Amen. <laughs>